Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the show. The best in paranormal talk radio is on the air. This is Beyond the Darkness. And because the Legion of Army of Darkness has cried out for it, we've heard your cries, folks. We know what you want on this show. And being the guys that we are, Tim and Dave, we've put it together for you, a special edition. This is True Crime Tuesday on Beyond the Darkness, our first installment. Now, this is important. Make sure you download this show and listen to the show, rate and review the show. Let them know that you like it by downloading the show often and sharing it with as many people as you can that may not be as so into the paranormal aspects of the show, but like true crime, make sure you share the show so we can continue to grow it. Our hope is to extend the show to six episodes a week, our five regular paranormal episodes, and every Tuesday, a true crime Tuesday installment. That's what's going on tonight. For a quick look at the rest of the week, Wednesday, we have a paranormal life, the good, the bad, and the aliens. MJ Myers joins us to talk about her story. Thursday, Savannah Haunts. We're going to look at some Southern Scares in Savannah, Georgia. And then on Friday, the Extra Dimensionals, True Tales of Alien Visitors. John D'Souza, a former FBI investigator, is going to be here with us. And we've got a brand new theater of the mind. It's an alien encounter story, a true alien encounter story from Tim Haas. So you're going to want to make sure to tune in for that. That's what's on tap this week. Tonight, we're going to dip back into the world of true crime. And a little later on in the show, uh, we're going to go back to dumb crimes, stupid criminals, take a look at what our good friend Florida man has been up to since we've taken this little hiatus. And I'll be joined this evening by Jason Gowan, a good friend of the show. And uh, you might rec- recognize him from um, shows like Extreme Paranormal. He's got a couple of new projects in the works and has been a, a guest on our show on numerous occasions. He's also an Amityville horror expert, but he's going to join me for some Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals later on tonight. You had a chance to listen to him and hanging out with us last night on our Parish Air and uh, Supernatural News Monday. He'll be back again in a little bit tonight to have some more fun. But let's get started. Our guest joining us this evening has been with us before on Darkness Radio. This is her first time to visit us on Beyond the Darkness. Catherine Casey is an award-winning journalist who's written for Rolling Stone, TV Guide, Reader's Digest, Texas Monthly, and many other publications. She's the author of seven previous true crime books and the creator of the highly acclaimed Sarah Armstrong mystery series. Casey has also appeared on Oprah, Oprah Winfrey's Oxygen Network, Biography, Nancy Grace, E! Network, True TV, Investigation Discovery, and Travel Channel, and A&E. She lives in Houston with her husband and their dog, Nelson. She's here to talk to us tonight about a case that we knew would be perfect for our show. The book is called Possessed, the infamous Texas stiletto murder. Welcome to the show, Catherine Casey. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be with you. Well, it's a pleasure. Boy, this is uh, what an interesting story. Um, let's give people a little bit of background on this, and, and we'll uh, flesh out the entire tale as the show progresses here. But uh, how do you go about picking which stories you want to cover when you decide to tackle a new true crime book, Catherine? Well, I look for something that's unusual, something with a lot of twists and turns, Something that I'm interested in, I think if, if it'll hold my interest, it holds the interest of the readers. Uh, this book hit in a lot of different areas, this case. Yeah, this this is definitely one that uh, has twists and turns. I mean, this sounds like something that would have come out of a Hollywood movie, right? I mean, th- th- this almost sounds too unreal to be true. Well, I mean, can't you picture some of it? Uh, Anna Trujillo and her uh, devil worship and the pentagrams and the the chanting. And at the same time, you know, this beautiful woman with these stiletto heels. I mean, it just really had everything going for it. All right. In this case now, and, and it's titled Possessed, let's, uh, let's start to learn a little bit about the players involved in the story. And uh, let's start off with um, our victim. What can you tell us about this man? Who was he? What was his life like prior to meeting Anna? Uh, Stefan Anderson was a professor at the University of Houston. He was a brilliant man. Uh, he worked on uh, as a re- research scientist. He lectured to medical students. He worked on hormones. Uh, well, when this happened, he was working on a study involving hormones and premature births. So this is somebody who's very bright. He moved to Houston from Dallas. He moved to Dallas from his native country, which was Sweden. Um, he had kind of a, a tumultuous childhood. 
and his father had been abusive toward his mother and he had turned into this very gentle man he saw himself as the antithesis of his father and his life prior to meeting anna had he been married before did he have children what was he like in that situation uh, Stefan was married at one point. He married in Dallas and then lived in New York for a while working for a pharmaceutical company. And uh, the marriage only lasted a few years. They they kind of drifted apart. Uh, part of the problem, Stefan did have a problem with alcohol, and he would spend evenings kind of as you know some people do, sitting in pubs. And the marriage just really, they they just had two different lives, two separate lives. He always wanted children, he always wanted a marriage, always wanted a good family life. But despite all of his other gifts, this was something that he just never got. He never achieved it. Was there ever, in Stefan's life, was there ever uh, a history of violence? Did he ever act out, especially when drunk, or act threatening towards his ex-wife? No. Uh, actually, the opposite was true. Stefan had a tendency when he would drink to become even more, uh, he, even calmer. And he uh, even in, uh, there were instances, like there was an instance in a bar one night where he'd said something to a woman and she became angry and went to hit him. And all he did was turn away. Uh, I talked with his former girlfriends and they told me that he was always exceedingly gentle with them. And there was no red flags in this guy's life at all that you were able to dig up? Anything that showed that there might be some kind of extreme personality disorder or violent tendencies at all? Nothing. Uh, he just wasn't that guy. That's not who Stefan was. He he just really didn't believe in violence. And after having watched his mother suffer as she had during, during uh, his childhood and not being able to protect her, he uh, often told people that he would never be his father, and he swore he would never hit a woman. Well, that's that's good. I mean, we've got a, a decent man here, good background, good upbringing in spite of the negativity that he had in his life, and obviously a smart man. Now, Anna, and how do you say her last name? Trio? Anna Trujillo. Anna Trujillo. Okay. And what, what can you tell me about her life before coming together with Stefan? Well, she had uh, actually a pretty good job. She'd grown up her, in kind of a tumultuous situation. Her father had left the family when they were young. She had three br uh, brothers and sisters, and uh, the mom worked, so Anna had to help. And she was rather resentful of that because she felt like she had lost her childhood taking care of her siblings. But she'd done well. She did well in school. Uh, she married young and had two daughters. That marriage fell apart. Um, she claimed that her first husband sexually assaulted her at one point after they had uh, separated. But she had a good job. She seemed really stable. She worked for Coca-Cola as a merchandising person. And she had a lot of responsibilities. She had a corporate car. She won company contests and had all kinds of Coke memorabilia from her work. Uh, she was well-liked. She was very pretty. And she was vivacious. People just were charmed by Anna Trujillo. She, she's one of those people, Dave, you know, who, like in a party, will kind of take the time to go up to people and talk to them and really seem interested in their lives. So she very gregarious personality, very open, and uh, certainly an interesting background. Now let's start to talk about the paranormal aspect. Did, did this play a part in her life before meeting Stefan? She was intrigued. Uh, starting when she was very young, uh, she was interested in things like Ouija boards, and she talked about the spiritual thing. And uh, it, it was just kind of there as an interest in her life. And then when she was married to her second husband, he would come home and, and find that she'd been playing around with a Ouija board or, or doing uh, like chants, uh, that type of thing. And the neighbors noticed odd things. Uh, there was a very nice uh, young couple living next door with a couple of little girls. And the dad noticed things like one night when, she wa when he walked to the mailbox past the, uh, Anna's house, he looked up and he thought he saw almost a goblin uh, on the roof. He looked back a couple of times and thought that it was there. And then he looked back, I think it was the third time, and it had disappeared. 
uh, for some reason, Anna's house was the one in the neighborhood where the crows would congregate on the roof, which he thought was very odd at the time. Yeah. When he, it, yeah <laughs> that strange. sounds creepy, it's, yeah. So, when she moved into Houston, uh, it, it escalated. When she moved into downtown Houston, things just started really um, taking off. She left her second husband and got – well, she was working – she opened a massage studio. Well, let me, let me ask you one thing, building. Catherine. Uh, mm-hmm. when, she, when she would be walked in on playing with the Ouija board or chanting, did they have any idea what was she doing? Would she ever explain? Was she uh, trying to curse somebody? Was she just calling on spirits? What was the uh, – what was, what was going on to bring her to this point? You know, she didn't explain that. It was just that she was very interested. And the husband, first, uh, you know, her parents and later her, her husband would tell her to put it away, ask her to stop. Uh, her uh, second husband was uh, very Christian, and he saw it as an affront or a sin, and he didn't want it happening in the house. So they would have words over it, and she would stop. And it, I think it was part of what led to the divorce. And then, Dave, she became this masseuse in downtown Houston, and she was living in the old Rice Hotel. And the Rice has the reputation of being one of the haunted spots in Houston. And in the Rice, Anna was uh, doing the same things. She was late at night. She'd come home from the bars, and she was playing with her Ouija board. And again, the friends and relatives that that would speak about this and witness her doing it, would she play the board alone? Did she have somebody else she was involved with on this? And who was she trying to communicate with? She was just communicating with spirits. She would uh, sometimes have friends with her. Sometimes she talked about what she was doing. She started showing up at parties and instead of cornering people and asking about their lives and talking about them the way that she had in the past, she would start talking about her beliefs. And she started to think that she had uh, extra, uh, you know, paranormal or spiritual beliefs. She thought that she could lay hands on someone and cure them. Uh, she thought that she could feel sickness in people's bodies. She, she had this exaggerated opinion of her own powers. She started talking about her powers all the time. Mm. And then she went to New Orleans and she came back with a voodoo doll. She had this little voodoo doll in a wooden casket that she carried around to the bars in Houston. She hung out a lot in the evenings, but at night in the bars. She was dating a lot of men. But... At times, she would take out this voodoo doll and walk up and rub it on people um, and start, if she was angry with them, and start mumbling in uh, Spanish. And sometimes she would um, cut pieces of their hair or find something of theirs to take with her if she became angry. Yikes. So she definitely had kind of a dark side starting to brew. Um, was she pulling into herself? Did people say, was she having a major personality shift and change? You know, she, she started doing unusual things. She was drinking more, uh, so she got picked up for, on a couple of DWIs here in Houston. One time, uh, going the wrong way on one of the major freeways. Uh, and she uh, just became odder and odder. But she she was still the same Anna during the day and most of the time. Uh, but then every once in a while she would bring up her beliefs. She was going to uh, Uberia's. Do you know what those are, the, the stores? No, I'm not familiar. Well, we have Herberia's here in Houston, and a lot of the, uh, not a lot of the, a lot of them are patronized by people who are uh, of, you know, Hispanic heritage, and they have many types of herbs that they sell. For different purposes, you can go in and buy like an herb to make or a candle to burn to make money, an herb that will uh, cure any problem with your liver, um, different things like that. They'll often have a mixture of Christian symbols like uh, statues of the Virgin Mary inside along with things like a voodoo doll. Uh, it's just a kind of a, a coming together of cultures and uh so she started going there and taking friends with her. Some of them became just incredibly freaked out and left. Um, you know, it was 
they did see changes in her. She, you know, she did become more vocal and she became more aggressive. They, she was starting to do things in the, in the bars, like if the waitress didn't didn't respond the way she wanted her to, she went through a drink at a, at a waitress. Uh, she slapped a busboy one night in a bar. Um, the, you know, but still, the managers at the bar didn't tell her she couldn't come back because everybody liked Donna, and she would bring flowers and roses and give them to the men, and she would dance on the dance floor, and she was a very pretty woman. All right. When do these worlds collide? At what point does Anna meet Stefan, and how do they get together? Uh, in the fall of 2012, uh, Anna was living in a beautiful condominium uh, or penthouse. Well, not in the penthouse, but on the 21st floor of a beautiful high-rise condominium uh, near Herman Park, which is a very pretty part part of our city, and. Uh, with a, with a man. She had gotten to the point where she was going from one man to the next, living with different men. And uh, Stefani Anderson had an apartment in that building. He'd been there for a little over a year at that point. And they met in the lobby. And they started talking. And she was this beautiful woman in stiletto heels. Stefan loved stiletto heels. Uh, and they went, decided to go out for dinner and within days, Stefan was talking about Anna and telling his friends. And the next thing they heard, which was within a week or so, was that she had moved in with him. Wow. All right. Well, love is curious, right? It has its ways. Uh, did did she, now was she was still living with this other guy, did she move out of his and go directly to start living with Stefan? She did. At that point in Anna's life, she was, for the most part, homeless in a way, but she never lived on the streets or anything, but um, she just went from one person to the next. Sometimes they were just friends, and they'd let her stay for a short period of time. Very often, they were men she was having affairs with. Now, was she telling Stefan that, that she was being mistreated and abused? Was he... Was the hero complex maybe what helped push him to do this a little quicker than he normally would have? No, I think he was just enthralled with her. He was just, he sounded enchanted with her. He he started talking about, he, he was very lonely. Uh, he had a lot of friends, but he was still kind of a lonely man, and he was still kind of looking for that woman. And he had talked about finding a Latina woman who, who would teach him how to salsa dance. And... You know, she was just kind of enchanting, and he was very excited about her. He talked about being in love with her in the beginning, and wanting at one point that he talked about wanting to marry her. And then things started to change, and before long, it wasn't at all what he had anticipated. How long did it take for this transition to begin? Not long, probably six or seven weeks. First, he started complaining. He was working on a uh, research project, and he was complaining that he couldn't get his work done because he, she was always interrupting, wanting him to dance with her in the apartment or uh, take pictures of her. Uh, there were tons of photos of her on, and video of her on his phone that he had done. And then uh, a really strange thing happened one night over at the park lane in the apartment on the 18th floor. Uh, he called down and said that he needed the, somebody to come up, that there was water pouring out of the refrigerator. And they got up there, and Anna had cut, in the middle of the night, Anna had cut the line, the water line going into the refrigerator, and it was pour, water was pouring out. And she sat back and laughed while they tried to stop it. And when he asked why she had done that, she said that the um, she said that the um, refrigerator was talking to her, and she could hear it. And she was trying to make it stop. Okay, so now we're starting to see the fracture of reality seeping in before it was just a fascination with the strange and the supernatural now the refrigerator is speaking to her and what she thought by cutting the water line that was going to kill it or 
I guess so. I guess she was trying to silence it. She was also doing other odd things, like she was writing. She would take uh, pieces of paper and draw circle after circle after circle after circle on them and little snatches of uh, words. And she thought that this was some great work of art, that she had this incredible talent. And it was really just scribbles on a sheet of paper. Now, did she have any, I mean, in her family, was there a history of mental illness? And, uh, you know, did it affect her daughters as well? No, uh, there there wasn't any. And Anna was in her 40s at that point, which is really rather late to start presenting with something like this. So um, she, you know, the, she had, was not diagnosed with any. She did go to doctors, but she was never diagnosed with any mental illness. With that said, then, you've got a woman who went from pretty normal, very popular, very likable, happy person to starting to have delusions and issues. And he's seeing this within a six-week change. Is he familiar during any of this of her enchantment with the supernatural and the paranormal? Well, he was. But Stefan was an uh, atheist, as many scientists are. And he kind of humored all of it. He he didn't see it as being, uh, you know, a problem in the beginning. In fact, he told uh, one person that, that uh, Anna had been up during, in the middle of the night doing voodoo. Um, and he he didn't see it as, he was always re- really rather, Stefan was always rather intrigued with people who were different. And pe- he was always rather intrigued by, why, by other people's ideas. So, um, he would talk about it, but he didn't seem concerned about it in the beginning. But after the episode with the refrigerator, people started to warn him that there was something not right with Anna, that there was something going on. Well, did it take <laughs> – he's a scientist at this point. Is he not figuring that out on his on his own? He's got to have his friends step up and go, hey, you know, if she's talking to the fridge and trying to kill it by cutting the water line, she might have a problem. Well, you know, on one hand, she's doing that, and on the other hand, uh, she's catering to him and telling him how much she loves him and saying that they're going to get married and taking him home to meet her very nice parents and uh, her daughters and uh, talking about how they're going to be a family. I'm sure she was telling him that I can change, I can be everything you want. People can be very persuasive, Dave. Yeah, that I'm aware of. All right, so she's yeah. she's she's making her mark. Although there's some oddities about her, she's quirky, she's beautiful, she's catering to his interests and and needs on other levels. I'm sure sexual and mm-hmm. and egotistically and 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 kind of uh, making him feel good about his choice to be with her. Um, mm-hmm. Are there fights breaking out between the two of them? Do people start hearing issues or screams? Uh, anything going on as they're getting together? After that October event, um, Stefan started to try to pull away. And from there, then through, I think it was about February or so, um, they would have arguments. And he would tell his friends that he he needed to end it. He thought, he realized that he needed to end it by about November or December. He actually went down repeatedly and revoked her right to get into his apartment. And he seemed a little bit afraid of her, um, especially by the beginning of the next year after January of 2013. Uh, he started to talk about things like, well, you know, she gets a little rough sometimes. Some of his friends thought that he was, she was talking about, he was talking about during sex and that he kind of maybe liked that. But it turned out that he was actually talking about her being uh, quite... Um, you know, not abusive at that point, maybe, but uh, physical with him. And Stefan was an older gentleman. He he was quite a bit older than she was. He was in his late fifties. He was fifty nine years old, and you know, in January of the, in I think March of that year. And she was a younger woman, and she was quite strong. So he started to act rather uh, concerned about things, but not terribly in the beginning. But then as the months went on, it got worse and worse. 
How was his drinking at this point? Was he amping it up? Were, were neighbors or friends, relatives starting to realize that Stefan was was amping his game up too? No, you know, he, he wasn't, uh, it wasn't over the top. He had actually been more of a drinker in the past. He had gone through a treatment program in around 2012, and he was drinking but not as much as he used to. So that didn't, I mean, Stefan always drank, but um, and, and I'm sure that he was an alcoholic, but he was never out of control. That wasn't part of his personality. So that really didn't end, enter into all of this. He, but he would go out with friends. He had this circle of friends here in Houston, and uh, during the times when uh, she wasn't living with him, when she he kicked her out, she would show up at the bars. He was kind of a creature of habit, Dave, where he went to the same places all the time, and he met his same circle of friends, you know, kind of like a cheers situation. Oh, okay, and, sure. Uh, yeah, and she would just show up uh, and expect him to pay for her drinks, which he did. And then he started kind of hiding. He'd say to his friends, um, if Anna comes in, uh, let me know and I'll go hide and don't tell her I'm here. And then he said to one friend that Anna had come up behind him uh, with a, you know, and put her hands around his neck and started to squeeze, and he had broken away. So the violence was escalating, and she was drinking more. She was, uh, she was drinking considerably more as time went on. Very weird twists to this relationship and he was watching this kind of unfold but was still somewhat enamored with her even as she's getting more aggressive why if if he is afraid of the situation why isn't he just bailing out and you know moving her out of the place you know any any indication or idea of why he would stay in this long i think by the spring of 2013 he he was ready to to get away from her. He just didn't want her around. At the same time, he had a really hard time telling anybody no, and especially somebody that he had once loved. And Anna, he knew, needed help. Quite a few people said, well, just go away from her, just leave her alone. And she'd, he'd say things like, well, if I turn my back on her, who will take care of her? And there was just this feeling that he wanted to go away. He wanted her not to not to be part of his life anymore. But he just couldn't, you know, walk away and let happen what it appeared was happening, which was that she was totally falling apart. All right. You've got the, the ball in motion here. We can see the, the fractures in this already strange relationship. And both have their own difficulties, right? I mean, he's obviously codependent because he's staying in this kind of weird situation and wants to be there to help her, even though he really owes her nothing this short of a period of time into a relationship. Um, she needs him for some reason. Are, are past men in her life reporting back that she would start acting chaotically like this as well, or was this a whole new level of crazy she was entering? This was a new level. She had a history of becoming uh, violent and becoming kind of histrionic uh, in relationships, but this was a whole new level. Uh, this had escalated to this point. She started talking, well, this goes back a little bit, but in the fall of 2012, remember when the Mayan calendar was running out and right. everybody was talking about the yeah. world? Uh, well, world I remember everybody. when the world stopped? That was crazy, Catherine. I can't believe... <laughs> How the world just exploded on, uh, uh, on December yeah. 21st. Yeah, that was horrible. I know. Isn't it crazy? <laughs> but uh, she got really into that. She was just um, getting more and more into into the whole uh, spiritual thing. And, you know, it, she just really was uh, kind of falling apart. Okay. Well, there has to be a final breaking point, a tipping point that sends this relationship over the edge. Um, how long into this relationship are they when this murder occurs? It was about seven months. It was May. Uh, things started to really wind up at the end of May, around Memorial Day weekend in 2013. Uh, he had kicked her out, and this time he wouldn't let her back in. And she was staying with another couple, and uh, then 
unprovoked went up and uh, bit actually on the top of the head the man she was staying with and uh, got into a fight with a woman and showed up at Stefan's uh, apartment very badly beaten and on a head, bruises all over her body. They covered her face. Her chin was all swollen. Uh, it was really terrible. And Stefan again ran and let her move back into the house, in, into the apartment. But the agreement was just long enough to, to get better. And, uh, you know, and, and then she, he was going to send her up to Waco to live with her parents. Where did this beating come from? Was it the people she was living with after she attacked them? They they fended her off? Yes. Mm-hmm. All right. Yes. Have they called the police on this couple to report this abuse and this beating, or have they just let it be? Stefan did, uh, and he took her to the hospital, and they reported it there. But when they went out and talked to the couple, they found out that they were just acting in response to what Anna had done. So no charges were filed. Okay, do the police report that back to Stefan? You know, I don't believe so. Ooh. I don't know that for sure, but I don't believe so. But it didn't go anywhere, and Anna was supposed to be leaving. She was supposed to go up to Waco, and she was supposed to be out of his life. He was dating someone else by then. He was seeing another woman, and he was telling his friends that he just couldn't wait for Anna to go ahead and go to Waco to be with her parents. But the night before that was supposed to happen, Mm -hmm. uh, the next morning, there was a delay getting her up to Waco, and they ended up spending one last night together. And that's when everything happened. All right. Now, walk us through this. What what was the delay that caused them to delay this uh, trip one more day? uh, Anna was supposed to be driving to Waco with another woman, and it turned out that there wasn't room in the car for her that night. So they'd made arrangements for her to go at 7 o'clock the next morning. So instead of her being gone that evening, Stefan took her out to dinner and to a place called Bar 5015 here in Houston. It's kind of an edgy place right outside the downtown, not far from his apartment. It was one of Anna's favorites. And they spent the evening there. Uh, Stefan sat at the bar and, and drank, had some wine and drank and talked to people. And Anna drank and flirted and walked around from one man to the next and at one point was dancing uh, in the bar stool and just having a wonderful time. And then Stefan tried to get her to leave. He called the cab to leave and she uh, didn't want to go and the bar was closing and he kept trying to get her out the door and she didn't want to go and he finally got her into a cab and then she got into an argument with the cab driver on the way back and became really abusive on the way to the apartment. And uh, it got so bad that the cab driver threatened to call the police. And at the apartment, Anna went storming into the, into the lobby of this very posh apartment building. And the cab driver was so upset about what had happened that she took Stefan's hands and said, can I pray with you? And Stefan, as I said, is an atheist, but um, he honored other people's beliefs. And so she held his hands and prayed. And then she said to him, I'm worried about you. You need to get away from her. And Stefan said, I'll be okay, but thank you. And he walked back into the building and walked across the lobby and got in the elevator and went up to the 18th floor. All right, here's the crescendo, right? This is uh, this is when everything comes together. Um, he goes up to the 18th floor. He's already had this kind of precursor that this night is not going to end well for anyone. Um, but he still felt like he had control, right? Like he was still strong enough to take care of himself, see this thing through till the morning, get her out of the house, and have his life back. I think he... I think he thought, too, I think this was possibly at the point where he told her that this was really over. Um, he'd been so embarrassed in the cab that I, I, with her, you know, with what she had done, that I think he was at the point where he was just exasperated and, and he realized that it had to end. And they got up there, and that was about, oh, 2 o'clock, a little after 2 in the morning, and about 2.15, this is a very solidly built 
uh, apartment building. And about 2.15, the woman in the next apartment, the wall shook between their two apartments, and she heard banging, and it sounded like they were moving furniture. And then she heard somebody, they, she heard uh, somebody shouting, and she threw on her robe to go over there and knock on the door and complain, but then hesitated, and uh, the voices died down, and it got quiet, and she went back to bed. And all was quiet until about 3.30, in, 3.30, 3.40 that morning when Anna called 911 sobbing and saying that uh, she had been attacked and that her fiancé had, uh, you know, had been beating her up and that she needed help and that they needed to send an ambulance. And then she said, he's dying and the 911 operator said, what do you mean he's dying? And she said, he's dying. Uh, so they sent an ambulance and they sent a patrolman. And the patrolman knocked on the door. And Anna opened the door and she was covered in blood. She had blood on her hands, on her face, all over her clothes. The legs of her jeans were actually saturated with blood. And when they walked in, they found Stefan's body laying on his back with blood surrounding him, blood spatter on three walls surrounding him, and a pool of blood near his head. And Anna's uh, blue suede stiletto heel just a little bit above his head laying on the carpet. And that was covered in blood as well. So she physically beat this man to death with a stiletto shoe. She did. This is, I mean, I've been writing crime. Uh, I'm writing about crime cases since the 1980s. So it's 30 years. And this is among the most gruesome scenes I've ever seen. These pictures, the crime scene photos were some of the most, the grisliest I've ever encountered. Um, it was just this horrific scene. All right. Um, I mean, obviously, everybody wants to know the possessed angle on this case. Is this woman dealing with the supernatural? Did th did that drive her to this end? Was she just mentally unstable? What would be causing something like that? And that is, you know, I think where we uh, will, of, of course, launch into next. Um, once the police see this, how do they start to treat her? And is she, although she's covered in blood, uh, is it any of it hers? Does she have any bruising or damage to herself, or is it all Stefan's blood that she's coated in? Well, at first they didn't know. Uh, you know, they, they really didn't know what was going on. She kept talking about Stefan having beaten her, but then she at, they asked her, are you okay? And she'd say yes, and they'd say, are you hurt? And she'd say no. Uh, the the apartments in the apartment there's there's a really funny thing in in the phone call in the 911 call day where um, she um, she's going on and on and at times you can't understand her because she's been drinking and because her voice is kind of this this growl almost on the phone but at one point she become and the operator keeps saying slow down slow down I can't understand you at one point her voice becomes completely clear and she says be quiet well the 911 operator doesn't know what she what's going on she said are you talking to me and Anna doesn't say anything she goes back to that other voice there's no one in the apartment with her but Stefan and Stefan's dead if the altercation was at 215 and she called at 330 or so um, he's been dead for a considerable amount of time. So she thought she was talking to someone else in that apartment, but there wasn't anybody else there. Wow. Are the police treating her like a victim, or are they treating her like a suspect at this point? Well, at the beginning, they didn't know what they had. I mean, it was entirely possible. Domestic violence is horrible. It happens. And usually the woman is the victim. So we're all kind of programmed to think that, that if a woman says, my husband was beating me up, we believe that he, he probably was. 
But in a certain number of cases, it is turned around the other way. So in the beginning, they really didn't know what they had. But um, they started looking at the crime scene. Well, first they brought her down and they sent her downtown to be interviewed by detectives. And then they started pulling apart the crime scene. Well, they found Stefan's hair, tufts of his white hair, on his black leather couch in the living room. They didn't find any of her hair anywhere. And they saw that the blood was all really low to the floor. It, almost all of that blood spatter, and there was a lot of it, was within two to three feet of the floor, which meant that when Stefan was bleeding, when the person was bleeding, they had to be laying down on the floor. So there were just indications as they went through that maybe she wasn't telling the truth. And then when they started doing the uh, interrogation downtown, um, she started talking about many people in her past, who uh, men who she said who had been abusive toward her, but when they asked her if Stefan had been abusive toward her, she couldn't come up with an example of anything he had done. Of course, then when the forensics came in, it became even more clear because none of the blood in the apartment was hers. None of the blood on her was... Uh, on her was her blood. Um, they did, at one point, the people in the jail noted some fading bruises, but remember she'd been beaten up by somebody else earlier. Uh, they didn't see anything fresh, and she didn't complain about anything. Okay, so they're they're interviewing her about this. They're starting to see that there's inconsistencies in her story. She's contradicting herself, right? He was violent, he did this, well... Had this happened before, what other happened? She had no points of reference for them. Um, does she get to leave that police station, or do they end up keeping her in as now a suspect in, in this murder? They kept her in. Uh, they asked her at one point, how was he abusive toward you, uh, physically or psychologically? And she said psychologically. Here she is in the middle middle of this grisly murder, and she's not talking about physical abuse from him. Uh, so they listened to her story. Her story didn't make any sense. And it didn't match with what they were getting calls from the crime scene and they were telling them what they were finding. And they booked her that night. Or actually it was that morning. By then it was the next day. How violent was this attack? I mean, did she just catch him right with the stiletto and catch him in the temple and that's what caused the gu the geyser of blood? Was it multiple um Impact zones, what, what exactly can you tell me about her, her style of attack? Well, the medical examiner counted at least 25 wounds uh, from the heel where she had come down with the heel of the shoe and hit Stefan, mainly on the head, the face, uh, and on the hands. She had no defensive wounds on her body at all, uh, no bruising or anything on her arms from holding her hands up to protect herself but he had defensive wounds all over his arms from putting his hands up to try to cover his face. And it appeared that he had tried to turn his face to the side to get away from her. They surmised that she must have been sitting across him, kind of straddling him, uh, sitting across his chest. And that was why her jeans were so saturated with the oh. blood because there was blood pouring out of the wound in his head, and that wow. made that blood pool on the carpet, and that transferred to her to her jeans. Are they getting any impression that she's uh, obvious? I mean, she's a liar at this point. They're, they're picking up on that, but are they getting any other kind of mental disturbance uh, vibe from her at all? Well, they asked her, actually, at one point if she had ever been diagnosed with any mental illness, and she said no, and... They said, do you have any uh, mental issues or any psychiatric issues we should discuss? And she said no. And she had no history. You know, there was nothing documented. Um, could she, you know, it, there were things happening, but it wasn't, you know, she didn't have like a diagnosis of schizophrenia or something that mm -hmm. might have added into this. So, oh. Well, <laughs> And one of the oddest things was at the crime scene when they were uh, going through her purse, they pulled out a tarot card book 
uh, Anna was doing tarot cards with people. And as they pulled the tarot card book out of her purse, it was open to the death card. Well, and uh, now for people that know too, the death card doesn't always indicate death or murder. No, it, it can it indicate the the transition of one time to another. Her her moving mm-hmm. from uh, where she was to a different place or a job change, things mm-hmm. like that. So, mm-hmm. but it's certainly ominous and gives you a good Hollywood twist there, doesn't it? It does. She had done something else that night too. She had told one of her friends earlier that evening. Uh, she handed him two uh, a couple of coins and told him to put it in his cupboard at home, and he kind of laughed at her and said, Anna, why would I do that? And she said, if you don't, something very bad is going to happen. Interesting. So there she... was something going on right. in her mind. I, you know, this this isn't, you know, it they kind of foreshadowed this murder that night. So Now, obviously, you know, they've got her pretty much dead to rights. Does she ever admit that this was just an out-and-out murder? What is her excuse as court starts to loom and the idea of paying for these crimes? She maintained what she did that first night in the 911 call, which Mm -hmm. was that he had attacked her, um, and he had come at her, and she described this attack, but it, as I said, it did not match the forensic evidence in the apartment at all. So... um, but she said that, and it started going out all over the world. I mean, this story got picked up. I was actually in London when this happened, and uh, I was in a hotel room and turned on the TV, and the BBC had it on. And what they reported was that uh, this was a woman who was, uh, you know, reported that she was in a domestic violence situation and struck out in self-defense. Everything I saw, everything that was reported in the early days and the early weeks, was that this was self-defense. And how quickly and, how quickly did Stefan's uh, family and friends start to step forward and say, this is not the man that we know? Within a day. Uh, that, within a day. That, that Monday when the assistant DA in charge of the case got into his office, there were phone calls from Stefan's friends all over the world who said, no, Stefan would not have done that. That's not what he was like. He wasn't that guy. And still at the beginning, you know, the DA didn't believe it. The, the assistant DA who handled it kept it had a really hard time understanding why Stefan didn't fight back, you know, why he just laid there and took it. And, you know, it was just not who Stefan was. He was not going to fight back. I don't think he probably really understood how much trouble he was in until she had hit him quite a few times and he started to fall. And then at that point, I don't know that he had the strength to fight back. The strength or wherewithal. There's also a theory. Hmm? That, there was a... Oh, go ahead. No, I was just saying the strength or the wherewithal, the, the conscious... Uh, at that point, he may have t- taken so many quick blows to the head that he, there was no making sense of what was going on in his world. That's very possible. The other thing is when they did the autopsy, they found some bruising around his chest. Uh, they think that was from her sitting on him. And it was possible that the adrenaline rush was so big uh, from what he was going through. I mean, Stefan was 59, that it may have caused some type of a cardiac event that uh, exacerbated the situation and made it difficult for him to respond. Hmm. All right. Uh, the idea of possession, does, does the defense ever start to bring that up in this case? Or is it just because of the odd way she acted and her interest in the occult and and the paranormal that started to make people question how she would end up doing something like this. No, they actually, the defense didn't go there at all. Um, I don't think they thought that it would help them. It didn't enter the courtroom except in that tarot card book. And one of the really interesting things was that she left all these notes behind. Remember I told you she was making those notes where she was drawing circles and Well, on one of those notes that day, Dave, she had written out uh, calling for uh, a spirit to appear to her, Uh, somebody she called Christian, uh, it it was hard to read, but it was like Christian Levator or Christian Lever um, to appear. So um, then she left odd things behind. There was a, like this little teepee hut thing, that was made out of woven wood. And I talked to a Santeria priestess in New Orleans and sent her a picture of it. 
and she thought that it was a spirit containment vessel that when people would call spirits back sometimes they would try to contain them within things and she thought that that's what Anna was doing with it. So um, there were little indicators there but it was almost as if nobody wanted to talk about it at the trial. The prosecutor brought up the tarot card book but that was the extent of it and the defense didn't go there. The defense tried to go with what Anna had said which was that uh, this was really purely self-defense. It really wasn't until... Our right, and in a sense, they don't want to uh, play up the possibility of her being um, crazy, I would guess, uh, at this point, right? They're just trying to show it as a, a woman under duress and stress dealing with something horrific and, and negative. Right, they were trying to say she was the victim, you know, mm. and and she just fought back. And, yeah, uh, she hit him 25 times with a stiletto heel that had a metal rod in it that was almost like hitting him with an ice pick. But she was reacting to what he had done. And, you know, she just she didn't realize, you know, how badly she was hurting him until he was actually already in a lot of trouble. So they were they were actually just trying to prove that that it had been the reverse, that he had gone after her. They were kind of stuck with what she said in the recorded interview she'd done with police that first night. So, you know, and the other thing is that in Texas, the law is that unless you don't know the difference between right and wrong, uh, mental illness is not a defense. Somebody drinking and then acting out, uh, even though they've been influenced by the alcohol, well, that's not a defense in a murder case. Right. So um, she was not so psychologically impaired that she couldn't carry on a conversation that she didn't know the difference between right and wrong. How did you, uh, did, when, when putting the story together, were you following it at the time or was this something that you did much later? And did you get a chance to sit in front of Anna at any point? Well, you know, I went to the, I always start out with the trial. So I went to the trial. It was really a fascinating trial. It went on for about three weeks. And, uh, I, you know, I met a lot of people there, and then I, after the trial, I started fanning out. I didn't know about this whole, uh, you know, uh, about the uh, spiritual aspect of this or, or the, you know, uh, the things that Anna, Anna was delving into until the trial and not didn't get much of it until after the trial. One woman got up on the stand during the trial and said she, this was during the punishment phase, a friend of Anna's who said she'd been afraid of Anna and she thought that Anna was uh, stalking her dreams and that she had been having dreams of Stefan and Stefan was asking her to clear his name, that he would never have done this. So that came out at the trial, but there was just a touch of it. And then as I started going around, at first people were really reluctant to talk about all of this uh, aspect of it. But as I went back and interviewed people more and more, they started to kind of say, well, you know, there was this thing that she was doing. And then it started to come out. And once I knew about it and I knew to ask about it, then they would tell me. They would say, yeah, well, you know, once when she was at our apartment, she drew a pentagram on the floor out of salt and put candles on the corners of the star and sat next to it with her hands up and her eyes closed and chanted. And when we asked her what she was doing, she said, I'm driving the evil spirits out of your apartment. But it took a while. People were right. reluctant to talk about that aspect of her life. Well, and that's understandable, right? I mean, they're, you mm -hmm. know, they don't want sure. to seem like they're nuts, too. Um, and and why wouldn't, you know, I guess in that situation, then, too, it, it kind of falls on to, well, why didn't you say something? Why wasn't this brought up more, um, you know? probably trying to deal with and avoid their own guilt for the situation that they're dealing in. Well, a lot of them, especially that last few months when Anna was becoming progressively more violent, had seen things in her and they had pulled away from her. And Anna had called a few of them when she'd been kicked out of that, that last apartment she was staying in, looking for someplace to stay, and they had all turned her down. And the last one she called was Stefan, and he took her in. Mm. So I think some of them had a sense almost of guilt, you know, that 
Survivor's guilt, this right? Happened, sure. And now look, but you know, of course, they shouldn't have. But we're human, and we do. We internalize these things, right? So it it was just there were a lot of emotions at play over it, hmm. and and this aspect of it just made the whole thing so 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 much stranger. Yeah, the the case, how quickly does it fold up once it's in court? How quickly do they come to the conclusion she did it, it wasn't self-defense, this was murder, and, and what was her um, penalty for all of this? Well, um, you know, it's in, in the courtroom, this, this started to come together pretty quickly, and uh, there wasn't really any contradicting evidence. The defense attorney, there were a couple of really amazing demonstrations in the trial. One was that the prosecutor, John Jordan, uh, used a dummy and, and one of the stiletto heels and demonstrated how Anna had come down again and again and again with that heel onto Stefan's head and face that night in order to, to match those, the wounds that the medical examiner found. And a blood expert showed how he had to have been laying there on his back while that blood spatter uh, was made, you know, that that's the only way that that pattern would have developed. Uh, On the other side, the defense attorney tried to put on a demonstration of how Stefan might have attacked Anna, and it could have explained what happened, but it didn't match the forensic evidence. It it just didn't work. Right. But he tried hard. He brought in, like, a martial arts guy to try to explain it. So she was convicted. And then they went through the punishment phase, and a lot of people came in to talk about what Anna had become. Now, now remember, this is a woman who was a suburban housewife, mom, a working career woman who had a great job just like four or five years earlier. But the testimony at the trial was what she became during those last couple of years before, before the murder. And uh, they talked about things they had seen, that the violence that they had seen in her at the end. So they, you know, it's really unusual for a woman in a murder case to get a life sentence. Uh, you know, we had the Susan Wright here case here in Houston, which is the bloody mattress case where a, a woman stabbed her husband 95 times and she got 20 years. Hmm. But based on the testimony and what, people saw in what Anna had be- become, uh, she did get a life sentence. Has she spoken to you regarding this book and your research? No, she hasn't. I tried. I, you know, I always go in, I, in. I've been in the prisons many times over the years. I always try to go in and interview the people afterward. Mm-hmm. I always ask, show me something that proves that you're innocent if they're saying that they're innocent. Um, and then I go out and try to investigate that. I mean, you never know. We do have innocent people in our prisons. Right. I mean, juries are wrong sometimes. Mm-hmm. We're all human and we make mistakes. So um, I did the same thing with Anna. I, I tried to go and interview her in prison, but she, I, I drove all the way there. But when I got there, uh, they told me that she had changed her mind, decided not to talk to me. So I have not spoken with her. But I did. I was in the courtroom when she testified. And... Uh, I also watched her videotaped test, uh, you know, interrogation, which is, I think, three or four hours long. So I did get to hear what she had to say. Do you think that all of this work with the spiritualist and, and conjuring affected her to do this murder? Do you believe that there was a case of possession involved here? Or do you think that this was just a mentally broken woman? I, I don't believe she was actually possessed. But I believe that she believed that she had contacted spirits. Um, you know, like I said, in the middle of that 911 call, her voice clears up, becomes crystal clear for just that second, and she orders somebody in that apartment to be quiet. Uh, that note sitting there, you know, asking that spirit to appear to her. Did they ever clarify that in any of the court proceedings? Who was that you were speaking to? Who did you tell to be quiet? No, they just didn't go there. They they brought in the right, that but you would think okay. Book. I understand not going there for the supernatural aspect, but if you're listening mm-hmm. to a phone call, you now know the man has been dead for at least an hour. You would think, is there a second person? Could this be how she overpowered him and was able to do this? I would think that that would have uh, opened up a, a can of worms that they would have wanted to investigate. Of who was she speaking to? 
Well, that, that night she, they, had asked, um, <clears throat> they had asked her if anybody else was in the apartment, and she said no. And this was a high-security apartment building where they had videotape all over. So they knew nobody else had entered, and they needed a key card to get in. So nobody else had come in that apartment building that night during that time and gone up to the 18th floor. So they knew no one else was in there. So it never did become part of, you know, part of it. And uh, it, it just didn't, it didn't help the defense's case at all, mm-hmm. and the prosecutors didn't need it. Interesting. I would have thought it, it might have, um, in, in a way. I, it just... What a strange, strange situation. Well, Catherine, I can't thank you enough for coming back and, and spending some time with us on our Return to True Crime Tuesday format this evening. Uh, what a chilling story. Have you got any new ones that you're starting to uh, look into that you can tease us with? Well, I've got a new book I just finished. Um, I think it's coming out late this year. It's on the Kaufman County prosecutor murders, the ones up outside of Dallas. Uh, that's the one where the Justice of the Peace murdered the district attorney, his hmm. wife, and one of the other prosecutors. Happened back in 2013, made big headlines. They thought it was the Aryan Brotherhood at first, but it turned out to be this strange little Justice of the Peace who liked to play Dungeons and Dragons. Well, we will have to revisit with you about that when that book uh, becomes available, so please keep in touch with us on that. Hey, we're going to take a break, and then when we come back, our good friend Jason Gowan is going to join us as we take a look at dumb crimes and stupid criminals, the triumphant or not-so-triumphant return of Florida, man. We've got more coming your way, dumb crimes, stupid criminals, here next on Beyond the Darkness, True Crime Tuesday. We're back. This is the triumphant return of True Crime Tuesday on Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. Tim Dennis is still out ill. He'll be back with us next week for Parashare Supernatural News. And if you tuned in yesterday, you heard our good friend Jason Gowan joined us and uh, spent a little bit of time having laughs and, and fun with us. Tonight, he's back for True Crime Tuesday, the stupid crimes and dumb criminals section of the show. And boy, when I think of dumb criminals, you're the first person that jumped to mind. So thank you for being here with us again, Jason. Oh, no problem. I uh, I posted my own wanted poster all over your bathroom just so you would keep thinking of me. Well, that's the only way to keep you in uh, fresh in my mind. We've got a bunch of stories coming in this week, and uh, I want to thank our listeners for pointing out some of these crazy tales. So let's get going. Uh, a person dressed in the suit of an extraterrestrial creature tried to escape from police in the city of Ufa. Law enforcement officers of Ufa had to detain the person in the suit. Eyewitnesses said that the alien entered a food store and scared all the salespeople in it. It turned out later that the alien was a member of a TV crew from Moscow. The crew arrived in the city to film an episode of a popular TV show in which they inspect food stores and assess levels of service. Boy, that sounds like a hot show. Uh, How come you haven't signed up for one of those here in the United States? Oh, uh, there's legal ramifications if I even try. (laughs) Not allowed in alien costumes in grocery stores? There was an incident in 92, (laughs) and I've I've got a – it's a 20-year retainer on it. (laughs) Well, those crazy Russians – okay, so this idea. We're going to go to grocery store, inspect food store to assess level of service. Will be big hit. How can we make it better? I know. Put our guy in a costume like alien. That's the big it's, idea. Uh, it's best to catch moose and squirrel. <laughs> the crew, including the person in the alien suit, were allowed to continue working. Meanwhile, Russian ufologists believe that represent- <laughs> representatives of extraterrestrial civilizations will be visiting the Earth more frequently in 2017. 
and encounters will be most frequent in Russia's Ural region, known as the M Triangle. The triangle is a territory between Svrdl and the Perm regions. Unidentified flying objects appear in the area every two or three years. Nothing happens for the next uh, 12 to 13 years, but the extraterrestrial activity then resumes. So that's the big uh, weird dumb crime coming out of out of Russia. I guess it's bad form to dress up as an alien and go in and harass the uh, <laughs> people of grocery stores while dressed well, I, as an alien. On top of that, though, I guess it's best that they're checking their Ural region rather than the anal region. Yeah, that's true. Hey, we're going to go all the way uh, from Russia. We're going to go all the way around the world, Jason. So I hope you've brought your uh, your parka. We're heading to the stately state of Missouri. Are you ready for this one? This is a case I thought you would probably be uh, wishing that you were on the reciprocate or on the uh, receiving side of this very bizarre crime. We're going to Peevely, Missouri, where Brianna Wiley called the Peevely police last Friday night when she returned home with her two young boys to find a strange woman sitting on their couch. I asked her who she was and why she was there, and she told me her name was Catherine, and she said she was there for a birthday party, said Brianna Wiley, and she was definitely dressed for it. There was no birthday party, and the woman was stripped down to her birthday suit, wearing nothing but a smile. I had to ask her (laughs) to let me into the house, and she put her clothes on backwards. Then she realized her clothes were on backwards, so she proceeded to take them off as I was standing there, Wiley said. Officers, who later arrived on scene and placed her in custody, advised that she was, I know this is going to be hard to believe, highly intoxicated, Jason. No. Yeah. yeah. No, there's no way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what uh, Corporal Benjamin Litterall of the Peavely Police Department had to share. This isn't the first time the woman has crashed someone's home drunk. How soon are you going to be moving to Missouri knowing this woman's uh, walking around looking to party in the it nude? Was, it was Peavely, you said? Peavely, Missouri. Let me, I'm going to pull up Zillow real quick and see what, <laughs> what we're looking at for the housing market. <laughs> well, I, I think with this woman in the area, it's going to either really crash or it's going to start burning up. The woman identified as Catherine Thorell was charged Wednesday for crashing into another Peevely home back in February. Peevely police said that (laughs) said in that incident, Thorell nearly missed hitting a mother and a child sitting in the living room watching TV. Authorities said her blood alcohol level was three times the legal limit. Now, Thorell was charged with driving while intoxicated. Uh, persistent offender and second degree property damage with a $10,000 bond for the Wileys. The damage is all mental. Her four and six year old boys can't stop talking about the incident. (laughs) Are they going to take her in for show and tell? I'm here for the birthday party. Mom, for me. (laughs) Now that's all we hear about is the naked lady. And including at school, school gets to hear about the naked lady too. Wiley said, (laughs) <laughs> oh, I am sure that they are. You can just imagine they're like, today for today for show and tell, I brought in the naked birthday party lady. Oh, my God. I, just, the balls of some people, really. Just I'm going to get into, head into this birthday party. First of all, how did she balls get into the tits. house? I was going to look at tits thing. Yeah. <laughs> how do you get into the house and just sit there naked waiting for the party? I guess that's uh, that's the Missouri way. You can't question yeah. it. <laughs> Well, the thing, other thing is, uh, who is inviting her to all these parties? I think it's you. Have you been Have you been sending out uh, invitations to people to try to get them to uh, show up to parties and just so you can see what the aftermath is on the news? Yeah, well, I also I, I'm a big chance encounter on Craigslist kind of guy. I just put ads out and see what happens. <laughs> chance encounter. You naked in my living room for a party that wasn't there. Me wishing I would have had a chance to see you again. Oh, God. In fact, it did a plus. Yes. I've got a couple of stories here. Before we take a dive into Florida, which I know you're familiar with, um, let's take a look at some of the other stupid stories and dumb criminals from around the world. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's a good one. We're going to go to Indiana for this one. A Columbus man was arrested Friday after police found him walking naked and yelling gibberish on US-31. He was looking for the damn party. He was a couple states over. It should have been Missouri. Is that where he was heading, you think? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a couple days' walk, but he was in the head in the right direction. Walking <laughs> around nude, yelling. 
Officers were originally sent to the 3100 block of Dale Court at around 4.18 p.m. to investigate a report of a person entering a garage. On their way there, police learned the man, later identified as 26-year-old Sterling A. Wessel, had taken off all of his clothes and headed toward a Kroger marketplace. (laughs) Where's my damn alien suit? (laughs) Police say an officer attempted to stop Wessel while he was walking in front of Kroger, and Wessel resisted. So the officer took him to the ground. Oh, asphalt burn. Oh, my God. Wessel, who was believed to be under the influence, I know another holy cow minute, Wessel, who was believed to be under the influence of an unknown substance, was taken to the hospital for medical clearance. He was then taken to the Bartholomew County Jail and charged with residential entry, public nudity, disorderly conduct, and resisting law enforcement. Uh, to me, the, the last name Wessel sounds like an 18th century, like proper English judge, and that he was just contesting whatever was being said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Judge Wessel! I am Thurston Wessel the <laughs> Third. <laughs> All right, <laughs> now I was ha- I got to be honest. Knowing you for as many years as I have, <laughs> I was kind of astonished that this next story did not include your name. I can't wait. We're going to Pittsburgh. You're even in the state. Yeah. A man who's a man whose company scoops up pet poop has been placed on probation for two years and fined five hundred dollars for buying fake secret service identification cards and badges online to impress women on a dating site. <laughs> Oh. Well, when you wow. are a professional shitter picker upper, I guess that doesn't that doesn't always lead the ladies on plenty of fish to your door. No, weird. You'd think that'd be enough. Yeah. Oh my god. Oh. Well, you see here, I uh, I'm a secret service agent. I'm currently undercover uh, picking up dog poop. That's just what I do. It's, this is my real job. I'm actually a secret agent. We're looking for packets of heroin hidden cleverly inside packets of dog poop. Christopher Diorio, 54, of Greensburg, was sentenced Monday by a federal judge in Pittsburgh. He pleaded guilty in November to fraudulent, fraudulently using an official seal, but acknowledged behavior in two other counts dismissed on Monday, flashing an ID card during a traffic stop and trying to use a Secret Service badge to get a government rate for, for a hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> and how much is the room? It'll be $109. Uh, I'm with the Secret Service. What can we do now? $106, sir. Your Honor, I'm not a bad man. I'm just a dumb man, Diorio told U.S. District Judge Noah Barry Fisher. What I did was truly stupid. (laughs) And I'm very sorry for that. Defense attorney William Defenderer. Oh, come on. That can't be his name. That cannot be his real name. It's D-I-F-E-N-D-E-R-F-E-R. William Defenderer. Sounds like a really lame superhero said that he was very happy with the sentence, which, among other things, will enable Diorio to continue helping his widowed mother care for his disabled sister and continue in counseling to save his marriage. (laughs) Oh, my God, this is like a country song gone bad. (laughs) Widowed mom, disabled sister. He's got a wife. What's his sister? And he's using the secret service card to try to get laid. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. Oh, my God. I, he was Diorio's wife. I'm not was, know how cheap he is that he did. <laughs> that he, like, was Expedia broken that day? Oh, my God. Diorio's wife, who is not in court, is one of the women he met online while holding himself <laughs> out as a Secret Service agent. <laughs> so he won her hand. What does she think he is when he comes home and... <laughs> grass stains on his knee and smells like poop. <laughs> it was a rough day, baby. A lot of anal anal checks. We got to make sure nobody's smuggling weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> well, honey, today we dealt with a lot of them people who've been pooping balloons. <laughs> pooping balloons. <laughs> The investigation began when police in Pittsburgh suburb of a reserve township said Diorio flashed a Secret Service ID card when an officer pulled him over for a faulty brake light. 
<laughs> the hotel incident occurred a month earlier. <laughs> How do you think that's going to get you out of a faulty tail light? Just tell the officer I'm going to go stop by Pep Boys and fix it on the ride home. It he had to stop like, by his secret, his secret underground headquarters and get the light changed. Come on, secret squirrel. I'm on the way back to headquarters. Q's going to take care of that for me right now. Oh, my God. They don't even usually, like, they don't usually just give you a warning and tell you to come get it checked out. They don't even usually write you a ticket for that. That's my point. How stupid are you? Diorio told the officer he was a Secret Service agent who had just returned from the Republican National Convention. <laughs> the Republic National Convention in Cleveland. His credentials said Diorio was a senior special agent in the Protective Services Division. And upon further investigation, authorities learned that Diorio's first and last name just happened to match those of a real Secret Service agent who Diorio has never met. Assisting. <laughs> what? That's like that. That's like an, that's like a Kevin James movie waiting to heaven. <laughs> it is. Or a Paulie Shore returned to the big screen. Yeah. Assistant U.S. Attorney Paul Hull told the judge that the case was especially troubling because Diorio owned several weapons and passed himself off as a protective agent in a presidential campaign year. What we hope by Is this bringing this website case... you have the IDs from? Because I would like to go order my own. <laughs> I don't know. You have to choose between the Secret Service or the Fox Mulder FBI one. <laughs> <laughs> or the Elvis Presley special FBI uh, card. Oh, my God. Okay, here it goes. Diorio told investigators he bought the ideas and badges for 100 bucks online back in March of 2014, when he also began to identify himself as a federal agent on online dating sites and his former Facebook page. In reality, Diorio owned the operated doodle scoopers. <laughs> a very successful... A very successful business in the Pittsburgh suburb of Bethel Park. And a second business that sells gourmet home-baked treats for dogs. <laughs> oh, my God. So he's got I like the kind with the pea-flavored sprinkles. <laughs> I'm sorry. My dog prefers a biscuit that smells like my neighbor's dog's ass. Have you got anything like that? Diorio had also begun buying handguns and rifles, one that looked like those used to equip secret service agents. Diorio had to surrender the weapons because he pleaded guilty to a felony. Authorities haven't named the Chinese company that created and sold the credentials. <laughs> oh, my God. How can that be? I don't know. I'm on eBay right now, and you can get one that's pretty convincing for eighty four ninety five. Jason, it is terrifying. It is a terrifying world we live in. Uh, let's go one more before we hit Florida. All right. <laughs> We're going to go to Sandusky, Ohio. Oh, no. Police say a couple in Ohio staged a murder scene in a bathtub in which they poured ketchup over her and then sent pictures to friends saying he did it. <laughs> Sandusky officers showed up after getting calls Thursday night from three people. Police say were hysterical. That's when officers discovered that the scene in the couple's bathtub had been staged. Police say Natalie Schlett and Micah Reisner are charged with inducing panic. I didn't even know that's a thing. <laughs> you, welcome oh, to the people's I could have had my ex-mother-in-law arrested like three times then. <laughs> inducing panic. My God. The IRS induces a lot of panic. How come they're not getting charged? Both pleaded not guilty on Friday. Not guilty. Police Sergeant Don Allen tells the Sandusky Register that while it might have been funny to the couple, it wasn't a joke to the police. <laughs> the couple couldn't be reached for comment. No telephone numbers were listed for them. Court records didn't indicate whether they have an attorney or not. <laughs> oh, my God. And they're also all out of ketchup. Here's the deal. So do you think this is what the guy's got planned? Micah faked Natalie's death, right? So now he can really wipe her out, and nobody's going to believe it. Gonna, oh, that Micah, he's back up to his hijinks. <laughs> Micah! Don't, 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 no. All right. Well, folks, I've been holding it off as long as we can. One of our favorite highlights on True Crime Tuesday, Stupid Crimes, Dumb Criminals, is... Uh, 
going to Florida because there is an abundance of dumb people in Florida. Boy, is there. A Cape Coral man told police he was delivering drugs to friends in Key West in exchange for a free vacation <laughs> before being pulled over for speeding in Marathon on Tuesday. Tyler Doidge, 21, was stopped just before 8 p.m. for going almost twice the speed limit near mile marker 48, according to the arrest report from Monroe County Sheriff's Deputy Matthew Corey. Dodge told Corey he was aware of warning signs that the 35-mile-per-hour limit is strictly enforced in the area and was on his way to Key West for vacation. After Corey smelled marijuana and told Doidge he was going to search the 2008 Buick LaCrosse, he noted... In the report that Doidge began to develop beads of sweat on his forehead. This is not normal behavior since the outside temperature was near 75 degrees. I have a protective vest on and long pants, and I was not sweating, Corey wrote. Doidge was wearing a tank top and shorts on the same evening. I conducted three other traffic stops, and none of those drivers appeared to be sweating. During the search, Corey wrote he found a black backpack with an 84.5 grams that's about three ounces of marijuana in plastic bags underneath the divider between the trunk bottom and the spare tire was a glass jar inside of which were 318 ecstasy pills with smiley faces stamped on both sides Well, that's a lo- that's customer service. That's going the extra mile. Not just putting a smiley face on one side, but putting them on both. Do as soon see- as you started telling the story, I, the Partridge Family theme song started playing in my head. Why? Come on, kid. Happy. Come on, kid. Happy. Doig said his friends forgot the drugs on the mainland, and in exchange for the delivery, they'd pay for his entire trip. He also <laughs> told Corey he'd smoke some of the marijuana before the drive. Uh, little do they know, the trip up the river is going to be very expensive. When asked to rate it from 1 to 10, he advised that it was an 8. Corey wrote of the pot's quality. <laughs> he advised that the cannabis was usually sold for around 200 bucks an ounce. Doidge was arrested oh. for possession of marijuana with intent to sell possession of more than 20 grams of marijuana, possession of 10 grams or more of Fentalamenophies, uh, which is also known as ecstasy, and use of paraphernalia to transport drugs, all felonies. He was also ticketed for speeding. <laughs> There's the cherry on top. <laughs> Doidge was transported to the jail in Marathon without bond. Oh, so, the so he can't even finish the delivery. Right. So this that's like straight out of a, a, a cop movie, right, where he starts getting the beads of sweat on the forehead and the cop realizes what's going on. This guy's like a super yeah. cop. Yeah, well, the other thing is, I'm not sure that I agree with the cop, because I sweat when it's like 40 degrees, and it's just lightly sun, sunny out, so that, I don't think that's a good way, but I mean, he was obviously right, but I sweat when, it, you know, in a blizzard. Right. <laughs> I do, too. I'm sweating right now in a cold place. Uh, <laughs> what do you got in the bag, straight <laughs> Nothing. Just keep moving. All right, let's get a couple more of these done. Uh, you know, we can't just beat up on Florida, man. Let's talk about Florida woman. Florida woman throws needles into the back seat with a child during a traffic stop, police say. Oh, Boca Raton, Florida. Police officers in Florida said they found three hypodermic needles within arm's reach of a toddler Tuesday afternoon during a traffic stop. When a woman in the vehicle was asked how this could happen, she said she panicked when she saw the patrol car's emergency lights and threw the needles in the back seat, according to a Boca Raton. <laughs> Police report. Christine Meyer, 31, of Okeechobee, told the officer it was a panicked, stupid mistake, police said. She remained in the Palm Beach County Jail early Thursday on $3,000 bail on charges of child neglect and possession of drug equipment. So what I'm curious about, I'm dying here. I'm laughing so hard tonight. But why is it that if you're doing illegal drugs or drinking... Why are you keeping them out in plain view ever? Why, why aren't the needles like tucked into the seat or under, you know, in that little uh, space in between the seats? You can't, you can't get a good fix from in there, Dave. If you, you can't shoot up while you're driving from in there. I don't know. I've never done it. I don't know. Maybe you're right, but it just seems a lot of these idiots should have thought this through a little bit more. You you know, (laughs) you just grab the needles and (laughs) Outlining the kid in the back seat like a Bugs Bunny cartoon. His kids get the apple on his head. 
<laughs> she oh she's lucky she didn't pierce like his little juice box or something. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> I don't think you're See, allowed to do she that. She's supposed to hold his Capri Sun, David. <laughs> oh my God! How old do you have to be to get your juice box pierced in Florida? <laughs> Oh, that, they start giving them out at five. Oh God! <laughs> oh, no, speaking I, of, I can live. I lived right in Boca Raton, and that's like a that's like a normal everyday practice there. <laughs> well, since we're talking about injections, <laughs> this headline this might win the day for me. <laughs> All right, pull it together, Dave. We can do this. Miami Dade man charged with giving illegal butt injections that left a woman in the hospital. Are there legal butt injections? Oh yeah, they they <laughs> botox the shit out of stuff down there. A Miami man was arrested on charges of providing illegal butt injections that <laughs> left a woman in the hospital. <laughs> I'm sorry, the victim told Miami Dade police she went to Carlos Gilberto Mendoza's West Miami Dade home for unknown injections all over her body from May 2016 to February. She spent $4,300 on injections <laughs> to her face and butt. Medical records show Carlos Mendoza, 49, I know this is going to be hard to believe, is not a licensed doctor. <laughs> <laughs> on Tuesday, the victim was hospitalized for complications from the injections. Police found Mendoza at his home, plus a cache of uh, lidocaine, Botox, and basotrastic, what is it, basotrastic water, which is used to dilute medications for injections. He was arrested and charged with performing medical procedures without a license and illegally possessing prescription drugs with the intent to sell. So the irony of this case, this man is going to go get a lot of illegal butt injections in jail. (laughs) (laughs) It's the circle of life. (laughs) Oh, Carlos, what were you thinking, my friend? Oh. All right. Now uh, I picture Carlos up over the other prisoners as they chant in that song place. Uh, all right. I'm trying to pull it together. Boynton, you okay. Boynton man accused of biting Publix customer while stealing meat. This sounds like a weird <laughs> sex fetish in Florida. A Boynton beach man was arrested Saturday after he allegedly attacked two people at a public supermarket and left a bite mark on one victim while stealing about $110 worth of meat, according to an arrest report. <laughs> Darian Gianelli is facing charges of robbery, aggravated assault on a victim 65 or older, and theft after he allegedly tried to walk out of the Publix in the Sunshine Square Shopping Center at Federal Highway and Woolbright Road with $110.04 of meat in a handbasket without paying. Gianelli, 23, was being held Tuesday morning in the Palm Beach County Jail in lieu of a $1,000 bail. Gianelli allegedly pushed a female employee who tried to stop him as he made his way out of the store. A 65-year-old man intervened and struggled with Gianelli. When Boynton Beach police arrived, Gianelli tried to run away but was quickly taken into custody, the report said. The 65-year-old victim had punctures in his right hand as the result of getting bitten by Gianelli. Gianelli told police he bit the guy because he was freaking choking me, the report said. The pilfered meat... That was the name of your band in the 80s, wasn't it? The Pilfered Meat was returned to the that store. That was Nips. <laughs> the Pilfered Meat was returned to the store undamaged, police said. Can they sell that, do you think? I, if it's still packaged, it's probably. As long as he didn't bite the meat, they should be okay. <laughs> nice meat. It's still Your package is very nice. All right, another Florida woman in the news today. Getting a tattoo on spring break seems like a great idea until your credit card gets declined and the shop owner comes after you with a social media squad. That was the reality Andrew Villanova, 22, faced on his vacation in Key West. The Florida Keys News reported Villanova got a $200 tribal shark tatted on his calf but left the shop southernmost tattoo on Saturday without paying, Florida Keys News reported. Well, first of all, did you expect a douchebag? 
<laughs> getting a tribal shark tattoo on his calf to pay. He should have asked up front because that's a, that's a good way to lose it right there. <laughs> exactly. You can't... Wait, you want what? I'm going to need to get paid up front. <laughs> tribal shark. Hey, and before you start uh, writing in angry, expletive emails, I have a tribal dragon on my arm, so I know what it means to be a douchebag asking for that tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> he posted his new ink on Instagram, which the shop owner saw and commented, bring your punk ass back to my shop and pay for your freaking <laughs> tattoo. <laughs> Jamie Snedeker, the shop owner, and her followers allegedly threatened him on social media and even worse, contacted his father. Eventually, Villanova <laughs> paid up. <laughs> Don't tell my dad. He told Snedeker his car got declined and left looking for an ATM, but panicked and never came back, according to text messages. <laughs> wait, wait, so he attempted to pay for it. His card was declined. Right. And so he just took off. And they said, no, he went out to go find find an ATM. Duh. What would you do? Right, yeah, but that's, he intended to pay for it in the beginning, and then he panicked. I guess. I don't, He's a spring breaker. He, he knew how much money he had left on his card. Finally, oh, exactly. let's let's wrap up with a Florida man story. I don't necessarily want to tell, but I feel that we've got to be fair to both uh, law and uh, lawbreakers. Recently okay. hired Miami police officer was arrested Friday after he allegedly stole from drivers that he pulled over. Jose Acosta faces charges for armed burglary and armed grand theft, the Miami Herald reports. He was on the force for less than a year, according to the Miami Police Department. Police allege Acosta would pull over drivers and scare them before seizing their belongings. He was caught in a sting operation and is currently relieved of duty without pay, according to the Herald. So see, there are dumb criminals, and in this case, you've got the dumbest when it's your own law enforcement guys doing this stuff. What a shame. What a funny, weird, twisted shame. It's a ballsy move. It is. Jason, that's it for our time together. Man, I've had a great time. Thanks for sitting in with me these couple of nights. Oh, thanks for having me, buddy. I I, I really enjoyed it. It's uh, It's been a blast. Um, tomorrow, folks, again, let me just run, run it down for you. Uh, no more Jason Gowan. He's now on work release. I'm letting him out of his debt to society. He no longer has to do our show. Tomorrow, A Paranormal Life. Good, the bad, and the aliens. MJ Myers joins us on Thursday. We're going to talk about spooky uh, southern haunts, Savannah haunts with Chris Allen. And Friday, the extra dimensionals, true tales of alien visitors, John D'Souza, a former FBI agent. I wonder if he got his ID card online from a Chinese place. I just ordered mine. <laughs> you should. <laughs> I want to see it. Make sure you post it when you get it up there. Um, that's what's going on for this week. And remember, I'm going to also be hosting Coast to Coast AM unless they listen to tonight's show. That might be off. I'm not sure. But I'll be back on Coast to Coast AM this Saturday, hosting from midnight till 4 a.m. Sunday morning. So for more information and stations in your area, go check out coasttocoastam.com forward slash stations. You'll be able to find all the stations in and around your world to find out how you can listen to the show. Or you can always tune in at knsiradio.com. That's the station I use right here in St. Cloud, Minnesota to um, produce and bring out all the episodes of this show and of the uh, Coast to Coast episodes. So make sure that you go check out knsiradio.com and send the management a thank you card for letting us do the show there. It's always a pleasure. Uh, but you can stream the show and listen to Coast to Coast AM live right from their site. Speaking of Coast to Coast, check it out tonight. Our buddy George Norrie uh, has constitutional lawyer specializing in food and drug law. Jonathan Emmert is the only attorney in history that has defeated the Food and Drug Administration seven times in federal court. He'll update his work on the uh, many issues relating to vaccines, including state medical boards retaliating against physicians who speak out against vaccination, as well as changes happening in Washington, D.C. regarding the FDA, followed by open lines. That's later on tonight on The Best in Overnight Talk Radio with George Norrie. That's Coast to Coast AM. Thank you for tuning in, and we hope you enjoyed tonight's True Crime Tuesday return. We'll try to do more of these and have more fun along the way. Special thanks to our guest, Jason Gowan for being here with us this evening and uh, also to Catherine Casey for Possessed, the infamous Texas Stiletto Murders. We'll be back again tomorrow with more of the best in Paranormal Talk Radio. This is Beyond the Darkness.